classes in polymer dynamics based on George Philly's book Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics Cambridge University Press 2011 and today this lecture is Lecture 30, the Hydrodynamic Scaling Model. This lecture considers the Hydrodynamic Scaling Model which purports to explain the phenomenology we have discussed in earlier lectures in the course. We have now reached the last chapter of the book. The last chapter of the book, the afterword, discusses a theoretical model that actually is at least more or less consistent with all of the phenomenological observations we have made. That prediction, that model is the hydrodynamic scaling model. I am happy to agree, in fact, on and later in the lecture I will discuss places for further work. The model is incomplete. My claim is simply that where the model has been applied, it has worked. Okay, so what is the starting point? The starting point for the model is the Kirkwood Reisman model of polymer dynamics. Kirkwood Reisman looks a great deal like the Zim picture, but it is in fact very different. And this point is not usually recognized. The Kirkwood Reisman picture and the Zim picture are actually very different in certain of their key results. What is the Kirkwood Reisman model? Here is a polymer coil. And we may think of the polymer coil as a string of beads. Kirkwood was quite explicit in saying that the beads were monomers. Uh, more modern models are a little more vague on this point. The beads exert frictional forces on the solvent. The beads are obliged to stay attached to each other. They're like the pearls on a necklace. And when we model the polymer chain, we model it as basically a bag of beads. The bonds between the beads, first approximation, serve only to keep the beads attached to each other. And now we are going to say, we, well, we have this complicated moving object. We do what any sensible theoretical physicist does confronted with this. We create an appropriate set of collective coordinates. And Kirkwood created as one collective coordinate the center of mass vector and associated with that is a center of mass velocity. And then, so that's the first variable, we have some sort of a coordinate yes, that's a direction vector and the direction vector corresponding to the direction vector, you can imagine the chain gets to rotate around the axis. Now there is an issue with um, sequential rotations not being commutative, and so you can specify an angular velocity, but unless you have a rigid object, specifying the angle is a little more tricky. However, you could, for example, specify here is the end-to-end -end vector, and that is a direction. And then you have a rotation rate in different directions. And so we have R end-to-end, -end, and since it's a vector, it has two rotation axes. There are several other ways you could do this. It also has a length r that could fluctuate. Kirkwood doesn't really talk about that because it doesn't come into his model. Mm -hmm. And so we have this coordinate. We have this coordinate with the rotation rate omega. And finally, we have what Kirkwood describes as the internal 
coordinates, which are simply described as fluctuations. And Kirkwood then buries things in the fluctuations and says they aren't significant to first approximation. So those are the coordinates and description of the Kirkwood model. Now you may ask, how does it work in a solution? How does it do anything? And the answer is, let us take our bag of beads. Here is the bag of beads. And we will push it, put it in a sheared fluid. The first statement is, we're on a long time scale, so the inertia of the chain is not important. And therefore, we have a zero force condition. The total force on the particle on the polymer chain should be zero. Now, the force is going to fluctuate on short time scale, so this is an approximation. And the statement then is that the drag coefficient of a bead I, they could all be the same, velocity of the bead I minus velocity of fluid at the point, add this up, this is the force on each bead, but if you add it up, the total force on all the beads is zero. So how does this work? Well, here is the particle. The fluid up here is moving this way. The fluid down there is moving that way. So different parts of the uh, polymer chain are being dragged in opposite directions. But if you look at the center, the center simply goes with the flow. So that's the zero force condition. The second condition is the zero torque condition. That is, we have this object, it's in a shear, there's a force here this way, a force that way, there should, perpendicular to the blackboard, be a, an angular rotation axis. And so, the beads here try to move this way, the beads there try to move that way, these beads in the middle are presumptively moving up and down. So the polymer coil is doing this. Yes, you see it rotates. Well, the polymer coil is rotating. And here the fluid is moving faster than the beads. And here the fluid is moving faster than the beads. And that creates a torque inducing clockwise motion. However, these beads are moving down, those beads are moving up, there's no vertical fluid motion. These beads are moving faster than the fluid, and they create a net torque pointing in the opposite direction. And therefore, uh, there, you can get zero torque if Ri cross Vi minus Vf. equals zero. Oh, we better put in a drag coefficient. Let me point out that the velocity of the fluid is not the same here and here and here, and you have to take that into account. Mm -hmm. That is, the fluid velocity has at least a linear gradient, a shear. Yeah. And so there is a zero torque condition. And from the zero force and the zero torque condition, you can describe what happens? Oh, there's one last thing I need. The beads interact via the Ocene tensor. So if a bead here is moving relative to a bead there, the bead here creates a wake that acts on the beads there, and therefore the fluid velocities inside the polymer coil are not the same as the bulk fluid velocities in the solution. And the claim is you can solve this as a scattering problem where you start out with the rotating bead and the rotating, a rotating chain, the moving beads create wakes that act on other beads. Those wakes can be rescattered because now this bead is moving with respect to the fluid flow induced by this bead and the wake can be scattered once and again. 
and so you have a scattering effect and the net result of the scattering is that if I look at a polymer coil, the uh, fluid speed inside this extent tends to be more similar than you might have thought to the motion of the polymer coil. And therefore, the drag force that the polymer coil exerts on the fluid and vice versa are reduced because the fluid in here because of those Ocene scattering terms, tends to move with the bead. I only said tends to, it doesn't move exactly. The net result is, if we ask how much dissipation, how much contribution to the viscosity of the solution we get, if we put a chain in, well, the crudest calculation says that the drag the contribution goes as m to the first, or if you measure the diffusion coefficient, the diffusion coefficient would go as m to the minus 1. But when you take into account all this, the um, effect of all of the scattering is to reduce the molecular weight dependence of the viscosity, the diffusion coefficient, and so forth. Um, and I have brought us to the end of the kirkwood Reisman model. The next step in the discussion, which we will do on the final lecture, or the final piece of the lecture, is what the Kirkwood, happens to the kirkwood reisman model when we look at interacting polymer chains. However, we're done for the moment. And so today, at long last, we have reached the final lecture of the course. What I am going to do today is to discuss the hydrodynamic scaling model, a theoretical scheme which is consistent with the phenomenology we've described. I am happy to concede that the phenomenological scaling model is incomplete in the sense it has not yet been applied to all of the questions we would like to apply it to, and I'll be discussing some of that later on. Nonetheless, within its limitations, namely it hasn't been applied to everything yet, the hydrodynamic scaling model is consistent with the bulk of observations that we have talked about thus far in the course. So we start off and we go back historically to about 1986, 1987. And I produced a series of papers, the first of which was the universal scaling model and the universal scaling model was said to discuss polymer self-diffusion. The observation I made was that if you sat down and you looked at the, the system, that is, you actually looked at the experimental measurements that had been done, what you found was that you did not, in the concentration dependencies of solution properties, see scaling laws. After all, if there were a scaling law, you would take a log-log plot and log eta versus log c would give you these nice visible straight lines. Well, as we have seen, the measurements do nothing of the kind in most cases. Fortunately, we did not start with hydroxypropyl cellulose viscosity or we might have come to the completely the wrong conclusion. Instead, we started with polymer self-diffusion and tracer diffusion. Uh, the inspiration for this was actually, while well, I was at Michigan, we started doing experiments on probe diffusion. Uh, Taiho Lin and I did studies on uh, probes in polyacrylic acid water. He did all the work. And uh, Greg and Kathy Ullman and I, they did all the work, uh, did studies on probe diffusion in polyethylene oxide. Oh, I should drop in Robert Lindner, who was the undergrad who actually did the first little piece of this. Uh, having said that, what we found, about 84, we had all of these measurements, and we asked, what generalization do we have? And the generalization was that we, um, gee, all of these measurements fit um, stretched exponentials. Uh, the alpha of the stretched exponential appears to be correlated to the size of the matrix polymer. That was very different from the period picture, which was that a polymer solution 
was a lattice. Uh, it functioned as an invisible fishnet to resist the passage of a probe depending on the regular relative size of the probe and the hole in the lattice. And this, this erect proportionality would be independent of polymer molecular weight. Well, that's not at all what we saw, and that's what I said in 85. And then Tim Lodge sent me a preprint of one of his papers on polymer self-diffusion or tracer diffusion. And I looked at the curves. This is while I was driving out from, Michi from California to Michigan for my first academic position. And gee, um, now that must not be the right, quite the right sequence. That was while I was driving later when I was moving. Sorry, wrong sequence. Um, so we look at the Lodge papers and we realize, gee, self-diffusion looks a great deal like probe diffusion. Uh, that, must have, that was 85, 86. And so in 86, 87, I did the paper saying that you look at polymer self-diffusion and you see stretched exponentials. Um, and I proposed universal scaling law, which was a stretched exponential. Of course, if you believed in scaling laws, this was a bit annoying because I was saying not only are your numbers wrong, but your functional form isn't okay either. So this, so I came out here from Michigan to WPI, and I'd seen the Lodge data, and we did work to show that polymer self-diffusion did the same things. Now at the time, this was extremely tedious, because what you had to do in period was to take the figures, or if you were lucky, you could get data from someone, blow the figures up so you could see them easily, measure off the points you, uh, using a uh, micrometer caliper to measure the distances horizontally and vertically one point at a time, uh, do the conversions to convert inches into um, whatever it was actually going to be. Then you had to do the fit on a computer. You could do the fit if you were patient. And it, you know, it was an enormous multi-hundred kilohertz computer and it really would get things done finally. Um, but it took a while. So having done all this, um, we were then somewhat ready to go. And I gave this discussion and I showed if you looked at a few viscosity plots, you gave the same result. And that was sort of reasonable to expect. After all, the, mo the theory and mathematical forms that handled self-diffusion and probe diffusion ought to give similar results for each of the, the other parameters. And so about 87, a number of people like Benny Ware made emphatically the point to me, well, this is very nice, but what you need to convince people is a theoretical model that explains what's going on. Well, they were right. I did need a theoretical model, but would it convince people? Eh, maybe not so much. Nonetheless, I had to cook up a theoretical model, and I sort of had a general hint of where to go because I'd started off doing calculations on spheres and the diffusion coefficient self and mutual of spheres at lower concentration. And I'll let us just briefly look at the self diffusion coefficient. Here is a sphere. It's moving through solution. It creates a wake. And the wake passes through solution, it finds another sphere. The sphere translates, it rotates, but it's in a field with shear. It can't simply stretch indefinitely. It's a rigid body, after all. And therefore, it scatters the wake. And the wake acts back on the original sphere. And this gives a series of tensors which in the um, Kinch and also more recently than Kinch, Van Sarlos and Mazur model gives you a, a tighter dynamic tensor Bij which describes the retardation in the motion of your initial sphere due to a second sphere over here. And that retardation goes as the ra sphere radius over the distance between the two spheres to the fourth power. That is, the, f the, re the f retarding effect of the second sphere falls off very quickly with distance. 
And so you have a cluster expansion, and you could do a hydrodynamic cluster expansion and calculate, for example, d sub s proportional to d0, 1 plus k1s volume fraction of spheres plus etc. And that was what you could do straightforwardly for spheres. So I already knew about this. Now, one reaction, if you say, we're going to do a concentrated polymer solution, was to say, OK, well, we will simply extend the sphere, the calculation, until you get tons of terms. And in fact, I eventually did that with various students. But if you look at, say, we're going to need lots of terms, not two or three, that looks a little tedious, especially since we're in the days when computer algebra was, to put it charitably, a bit limited. It was possible, it was a bit limited. So what I instead did is I had an idea. And the front part of the idea was we have this calculation was done for self-diffusion. We have the drag coefficient of the polymer coil at some concentration C. And this is going to be determined by the drag coefficient at 0, 1 plus some interaction parameter, concentration of polymer chains, plus dot, dot, dot. Yes? And my idea was that, well, suppose we go to high concentration. In that case, F of C minus F0 over C goes as alpha. And we, are, we can make the hand waving a little more detailed, but I won't. Uh, and my notion was that, yes, this is essentially df dc at c is proportional to all of these terms. And what I said was, here is this term alpha. And my idea was that alpha, gee, what is alpha going to be? Alpha depends on how hard it is to move the second coil through solution. And therefore, alpha should be proportional to the drag coefficient of the second sphere, roughly speaking, at the concentration C. Now, that's not what you actually have here. Up here, it's F, the, the second term is F0 alpha C. And what I said is, if you go to high concentration, this thing manipulates, bounces the solvent wake off back to the first particle. The larger the drag coefficient of this object is, the more of a bounce. And therefore, I will introduce this approximation. Yeah, there better be an alpha here. It's a different alpha now. And what is this? This is an approximation called self-similarity. And if you look at this, this is f prime, the derivative of f over f is equal to alpha. And that implies, you see this, oh, the derivative over the function is d log f dc equals alpha. And the solution is f proportional to e to the alpha c. So far, so good. So I had some, a, an approach which would lead to exponentials. The problem is, as we look at it, it would only lead to pure exponentials. <clears throat> And the question was how I got around this. And so I finally had time, and I sat down for a week to solve the problem. And on day three, I'd gotten this far. And I was walking back on John Wing Road. And it occurred to me, well, alpha is determined by this object. So alpha goes as the radius of the polymer coils to about the fourth power. And I suddenly remembered, back when I was at UCLA, oh, a decade earlier, uh, I had been a postdoc with Kivelson, and Kivelson suggested I join 
a seminar group that Phil Pincus was running on polymers. They were trying to read all the Degen papers, so that's what we did. And it occurred to me, I had this vague recollection that polymers shrank when you made the polymer concentration higher. Though it had been 10 years earlier, it had been a bit off the track of what I was interested in. And I then had to go back the next morning and find Rg square is proportional to c to the minus x. And x is about a quarter. And so this becomes e to the alpha. And it's really negative because it's slowing the thing down, alpha c. So this is the same as e to the some constant a r to the fourth Yes, and then there would be a c to the 1 minus 2x, where x varies from 0 for small chains to a quarter for big chains, and that's a stretched exponential. And now I had a derivation that actually predicted the functional form. Also, if you cranked through the fine details here, and we're a little more careful than I've been in this discussion. You realize that this piece was supposed to be molecular weight dependent. And therefore, the front constant alpha, this constant, should be proportional roughly to m. That was an approximation. And nu should show some sort of a behavior like that. Um, and if I compare it with experiment, that is indeed what you found. That is, I had a model, it was an approximate model, I admit, that predicted drag coefficient gives you the self diffusion coefficient, d is kt over f, is d0, e to the minus alpha c to the nu. This is a scaling exponent, and I could predict how the exponent depended on molecular weight, though it was a bit noisy. And I could predict how alpha depended on polymer molecular weight. Alpha is a scaling prefactor. If you view this equation as log ds over d0 equals minus alpha c to the nu, it's quite more visible. Alpha is a scaling prefactor, and I could calculate the molecular weight dependence of alpha. Um, and you sit down and look at this, and it actually agreed with experiment. That is, we could, it was, a, it, the measurements were a bit noisy until we had the results on dextran where things became much cleaner. Uh, however, um, we could actually predict how alpha and nu should behave quantitatively. Uh, it is almost unknown to be able to calculate a sp scaling prefactor, but there was the calculation. Okay. Well, so we announced the results, and there were people who were impressed, and there were people who weren't interested. And then, I decided, and then we started um, looking around a bit and asking what you could do to do things better. And there were several different things you could do to do things better. One thing you could do to do things better was to ask if there was another a way to replace self-similarity. And it turned out, after a bit, I happened to read a paper in JCHEM Phys by Andy Altenberger, who said you could get out of his renormalization group method either exponentials or power laws. And the, this we are talking now about the Altenberger. dollar positive function renormalization group. 
um, it is important to emphasize that the positive function renormalization group, PFRG, is not similar to a number of other renormalization methods in that it does not say we are going to collect things on a larger and larger scale and by doing so we end up with um, smoothing out the local features. It does not resemble, for example, the old style block renormalization. Let me give an impression of how it works. Suppose we want to write the pressure of a gas, say a hard sphere gas. Well, we have KT by concentration plus some constant concentration squared plus some other constant concentration cubed plus etc. Phi is n over v. It's the number concentration. Well, this is a virial expansion, and if you want to go to higher concentrations, higher number densities, you change the value of the number phi. Well-defined approach, and you have the issue that you need more terms after a piece. The terms are ac actually get interesting. Um, if you go out to about 12 or so, it is quite clear that some of the place around 12, the, the virial coefficients change sign, for example. Um, uh, however, having said we have this expansion, uh, the way you go take the pressure to higher concentration, the natural way is to change the number concentration. But you have a choice. And the choice is to say, I will reach in and I will rescale the interaction length. And if I rescale the interaction length, make it longer, that's the same as saying we're in a box of some size and I am changing units and shrinking the box. And therefore, we go to higher order, higher concentration by changing the interaction parameters. So the interest in this method is that it naturally gave exponentials and it also naturally gave scaling laws, power laws, which I suspected might on occasion be desirable. So we had this feature, and we could then use the renormalization group to crank through the same calculations and get to the same result, uh, namely that the, um, you got a stretched exponential in concentration. The other thing you could do, though, is to say, well, how strong are the interactions between polymer coils? And the answer was, from my perspective, you could reach in and you could use the kirkwood reisman model to calculate the interaction between polymer coils. That is, here is a polymer coil, there is a polymer coil, and we can write the position of a bead Here's the origin. We will write the location of a polymer bead as the position of the polymer center of mass plus a vector from the polymer center of mass to the um, point of interest. And what we would say is that we can approximate the motion of the, the position of the polymer. That is, we could also say there's a coordinate, little r of the bead, r is equal to r plus ri. And we could say that dr dt is going to be equal to the center of mass velocity plus omega cross ri, a rotational velocity. Yes, the, it's a rigid body. Mm -hmm. Approximation, it's a rigid body. We know it's not a rigid body, and Kirkwood is quite precise on this, but, and there are fluctuations, but it's we can still introduce these coordinates, and then we introduce two physical conditions. And the two physical conditions are that the total force on the polymer coil, which is the sum 
drag coefficient of each polymer bead, uh, velocity of the fluid minus the velocity of the bead, summed over all beads, and total torque, which is sum on all beads, drag coefficient, Ri cross V minus Vi. These two both have to be zero because we're at thermal equilibrium. Now they are not zero at every instant because presumably the system mass of material has inertia. However, at low frequencies, all of the inertial terms have damped out and the torque, average torque and average force are zero for all practical purposes. And once I say I can treat the, this is B, the, here is a moving polymer, it sets up a wake, and I can calculate the wake over here using, for example, the Ocene tensor. So this B sets up a wake over here due to Ocene, except I will expand the Ocene um, tensor in terms of this displacement, this displacement, and that displacement, and I can do a power series expansion in the little r's and average over them, I can get an interaction tensor between two polymer coils. Utterly unsurprisingly, the dimensional dependence of the tensor on um, the size of the polymer coil and the distance between the polymer coils the um, utterly unsurprisingly, um, the um, dependence of the tensors on those distances is exactly the same as it was for spheres. Because that's basically a um, dimensional analysis and we're looking at gradients sort of question. However, there's also a numerical constant in front and we were able to calculate at least approximately the numerical constant in front. And that meant that when we wrote e to the alpha c to the nu, which comes out of via the positive function renormalization group, drag coefficient is drag coefficient of 0, 1 plus alpha c. Maybe I should call it alpha prime. And you had to be careful because this, a little careful running this through here because the interaction strength depends on the radius of gyration. The radius of gyration is concentration dependent. And you had to be a little awake when you took that into account. Uh, well, alpha prime I could calculate numerically. Uh, there was a number which was the size of the polymer, the radius of gyration, and there was a numerical constant giving this hydrodynamic coupling, which we could calculate, exactly as the calculation had been done for spheres. Well, not exactly, exactly. For spheres, you have uh, hydrodynamic bounding surfaces, and the calculation is actually more difficult. Uh, nonetheless, we could calculate quantitatively what it was, and we calculate alpha versus m, and here are the measurements, and here is the theoretical curve, and when I gave an invited talk at the New, was it New York, I think, APS meeting in 1987, I was able to say, I have done the calculation, there is the calculation, and here is the theoretical curve, and there are no free parameters in that curve. We could, the curve, this line might be right or might be wrong, but it's here, it's not here, it's not here, it's here. And so we could actually calculate alpha quantitatively. Um, I did notice, and there was some work I did with an undergrad by the name of Paul Kirkatelos. And what we said is, well, this was the Ocene calculation, but you can improve that. And you can also do a calculation not of two chains, but of a chain and a spheric, small spherical bead. <coughs> now, the interest in the spherical bead calculation was that there were two things you could calculate. 
and one was the effect of the polymer coil on a nearby sphere. This is probe diffusion, which we've been talked about earlier in the course. The other thing, though, you could say is we could calculate the effect of the polymer coil on the mobility of a single bead of the um, chain. That is, you have this pearl necklace image for what a polymer coil looks like. And we could calculate how the hydrodynamic interactions between the beads affected probe mobility, affected bead mobility. The reason this is interesting is that there are people who take the position that, well, the motion of the individual segments is retarded, and you can determine that by measuring the diffusion of a small molecule through a polymer solution. And what we were, or a molecule to be precise, the size of a segment. And what we were able to demonstrate is that the effect of the polymer coil on the mobility of one of its own segments, and if the effect of the polymer on the mobility of something small that could be outside the polymer, are not the same. And, and you can crank through the I could crank through a detailed calculation as to why, but they're not e quite equal to each other, and therefore saying we will take out the uh, single bead mobility by doing this measurement on solvents um, is it's an approximation, but it's theoretically not perfect. There was one other thing we could do with this same calculation. We could calculate the interaction between a sphere and a polymer coil. Now in doing that, and I have slightly skipped over this, there was one key question in the calculation. That is, there is a distance of closest approach between a sphere and a polymer coil, and um, the distance is determined by sort of the radius of the uh, sphere and the cross section of the polymer coil. That's how close two things can get. That's also true if you want to do the interaction between two polymers. The distance of closest approach is determined by the cross section of the two chains. Mm -hmm. The first time we did this calculation, we just put in, we know what the molecular shape is for this polymer. We'll put in the actual numbers. And perhaps we were lucky, but that turned out to work quite well. This time, however, we had a big radius. This is a polystyrene sphere. We know this radius quite well. We have a little radius. And if you do the calculation, you discover that if the, the probe is much larger than the thickness of the coil, the thickness of the coil approximately drops out of the calculation. The simplest reason is that the distance of closest approach, I'm oversimplifying, is the sum of the two radii, this radius, this has a cross-sectional radius A, and guess what, A is much less than R, so R is approximately the right number. And therefore, the cross-sectional radius, the monomer, the bead monomer drag coefficient, vanishes. Um, when I gave a talk on this at one of the Gordon conferences, I had several of the French critics saying, well, yes, but the theory requires that you have the bead um, drag coefficient as an unknown parameter. And I was simply able to say, no, your theory requires this. My theory has risen to a higher plane. Um, any of it, so we could do the calculation, and then Mickey LaCroix and Jenks Yambert, who were both undergrads, did the experiments, and they did polystyrene latex. And the polymer, because we could get it with a very high molecular weight to a very high purity molecular weight, was um, polystyrene sulfonate, which is polystyrene, which has been chemically substituted, so it's charged. And you put in a reasonable amount of salt to eliminate polyelectrolyte effects. Of course, that's sort of equivalent to saying, uh, since this is charged and that's charged, the, distant, the likelihood of coming into contact is suppressed. And this number is no longer quite what it was before, but it's still small, so it still doesn't matter. 
And so we were, they were able to, we, to do the measurements. And they were able to measure the leading term in the concentration dependence. And then I got a couple points out here for very small polystyrene sulfonates. And the very small ones, um, the approximation, this is a random coil polymer, probably doesn't work very well. And I, we then put in the theoretical curve. And the hydrodynamic theory gave the right result for A. It really did. Um, that's sort of not surprising because the theory works perfectly well for herd spheres. And therefore it ought to work here if you do the calculation right. Nonetheless, we did the calculation and it worked. Um, another thing that came up at about the same time is I happened to run in to papers on the wonderful technique of dielectric relaxation, of which too many positive things cannot be said in this, for this method. And the issue with dielectric relaxation is that you could measure the mean square end-to-end -end distance versus concentration. And G, as you run up the polymer concentration, I haven't said whether these are linear or log scales, the chains shrink. And you could also measure a relaxation time, which is a rotation time. And the rotation time, if we plot log tau versus concentration, well, the early numbers might look like an exponential, but the data then falls off. And there's a curvature in tau versus concentration. The statement that there's a curvature is quantitatively explained by the, contract, by the um, change in the size of the chain to the correct power. That is, this is going to be... Um, E to the, the t relaxation time goes to some constant A concentration R square of C over R square of zero to a power, it happens to be three halves experimentally. And what we were able to do is to show quantitatively for um, the particular material that the deviation from single exponential behavior is indubitably quantitatively matched by the degree of chain contraction. Mm -hmm. And this, these are really good quantitative tests. Okay. Next. What does come next? Well, we had calculated ds using a series. We calculated D monomer. We had calculated D probe, and that result had been tested quantitatively at low concentration. Um, we had done some work putting in higher order uh, hydrodynamic interaction tensors. That is, I, I talked about the Ocene tensor, which is an A over R to the first. Mm -hmm. But that's only the lead term in a series in A over R. And you can, there are available higher order terms. The next one is A over R cube. And if you, in fact, do the calculations to higher order in A over R, you get slightly different quantitative results. And so we ask, what else could we do the calculation on? Well, one answer is the viscosity eta. Now, there is a history here. The history is that Kirkwood and Reisman had published their calculation of the um, if leading term effect of polymers on viscosity. And the leading term effect of a polymer on viscosity is two, here are two plates. One is moving, the other is moving the other way. We put one polymer coil into here. And we can then do the same calculation in two ways. We can calculate um, how this polymer, it's in a shear field, it 
can't comply with the shear, so it's putting force on the, pol on the solvent. And we can calculate how the scattered field creates hydrodynamic drag forces on the two plates. Or we can say power equals force dot velocity. And therefore, there is a dissipation that we can calculate. And one polymer coil by itself is enough to do this. That is, the lead term and the concentration dependence of the viscosity is there is a polymer coil present. It's not there are interacting coils. However, if you go to about 1950s, early 50s, there were a number of people <coughs> who tried to look at the interaction between pairs of polymer coils. And they set up the calculation, and they turned the crank, although all very reasonable, and they got divergent integrals. And the issue was, gee, why are we getting a divergence here? But it was realized the simple calculation that you would obviously do gave you a divergence. And because it gave you a divergence, you couldn't calculate what the next term was. And you had to do something about the divergence. Now, hydrodynamic divergences in general arise because you have to remember their boundaries out here, and the boundaries are doing things. The approach I did was to say, We will apply an oscillatory shear field. Admittedly, this would be a little hard to do mechanically. We will apply an oscillatory shear field, and therefore the total force we are putting on the fluid is zero, because we're pushing it one way or the other. And we then did some, com some very demanding computer algebra. It, fortunately, Mathematica came along, because some of the intervening steps had O, oh, thousands of terms. You do the calculation, you're looking at something with thousands of terms in it, and you would not care to do this by hand, uh, notwithstanding the famous 19th century example, the uh, French astronomer who did lunar orbit calculations by, okay, we have a team of four graduate students, you will each do this as pairs, and when you're done, you will compare results. And in the end, he had this huge book of formulas, and when this was tested with computer algebra, they found two terms at the very end of one unimportant series. The two terms did not go anywhere further, and one of them had a mistake that both groups had made and was not caught. And other than that, it's correct. It's a beautiful triumph of, care of human hard work. Uh, however, I used a computer. But I was pushing the limits of what you could do. Now you could do much better. Now instead of having a computer that gave a few hundred megahertz, uh, I could get a computer that, gee, we will buy a Tesla board, and I can get a computer that can execute this at one teraflop. And it cost a couple thousand bucks for the specialized accelerator card. So you could actually do this much less painfully than you could then. Uh, nonetheless, we got it to work, and I calculated the viscosity behavior, and you got um, a term for the viscosity. And the nice feature of the term for the viscosity is that, of course, it depended on the cutoff radius. That is, in the end, and in our original calculation, we just said we had two chains and they can approach until they touch each other, and we know molecular dimensions because we've heard of freshman chemistry. In fact, I used to teach freshman chemistry at one time. Um, so we could do that. However, maybe that's approximate, and maybe there are complications. However, whatever this distance of closest approach is, A, eta, it's probably the same as the closest approach you get in polymer self diffusion. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we were able to sit down and say, well, we have done the viscosity measurements, yes, and we have done the um, viscosity calculation. And if we compare the viscosity measurements with the viscosity calculation, 
that's telling us what the distance of closest approach is out of viscosity. Now we can march the viscosity data over to the self-diffusion data. These two sets of measurements are independent. I, I remind you of something, namely for polymer, if you look at the polymer self-diffusion constant and the viscosity of the solution over the low concentration values, you see non-Stokes Einsteinian diffusion. The diffusion rates do not match the, uh, the viscosity. Polymers self-diffuse much faster than you would expect from the viscosity of the solution. And a, there's a nice paper by Numasawa, beautiful set of experiments that shows just this. They have a slightly different interpretation than I do, but it's still a wonderful paper. Um, having said this, the two distances of closest approach are the um, same, and therefore I can calculate with absolutely no doubt uh, how the uh, self-diffusion coefficient should depend on molecular weight. There is one little complication you might worry about, which is um, how accurately do we know the chain expansion? And so the chain expansion is something we can pull out of self-diffusion measurements or whatever. Nonetheless, if you look at figure 8 dash, I think it's 36. Here is alpha versus m. And there is a line that is m to the first. And there is a line that is um, the slope we pulled out for um, what did we pull it out for? I'm pulling a blank. We pulled the slope out of something else. So there are two lines there, are slightly different slopes. But there are, the height has no free parameters in it. Mm. And the lines go right through the measurements. So we could actually eliminate all question about free parameters. And we've done that. OK. So that's about as far as we got. Oh, 836, alpha versus m, no free parameters. Um, having said this, there was one last thing we did, and we didn't get quite as far on that. And the last piece was to say, well, we have this image, and the image is a renormalization image, and we then introduced temporal scaling. And the temporal scaling analysis says that if you are looking at one of the dissipative properties and you plot it versus frequency, this could be log frequency, and you divide out the, the uh, pointless frequency dependence so that at low frequency that this material property is frequency independent, which is what you expect, which are equivalently the interesting parameter says the force is proportional to the acceleration, not to the displacement. You get something, and there's a stretched exponential piece, and a power law piece, and eventually you discover at high, very high frequencies you're kind of left with solvent, maybe not exactly. And maybe there are some high frequency things because the polymer has several things going on. And that functional form could readily be tested against experiment. And if we go back to the chapter on viscoelasticity, we had vast number of curves in the temporal scaling onsatz. It's an onsatz. It's not a full derivation. It's a, this is how you do it, predicts exactly the observed forms. Um, so we could do that, too. Uh, we could also sit down and say, well, you know, colloids and polymer chains have the same forces between them except topology. And therefore, we could do a serious analysis of spheres and all of their properties. We did this in particular for viscosity of hard spheres. And 
very rapidly we observed, it's very visible, uh, hard spheres have a solution-like, melt-like transition. So if I plot eta versus C, there's a solution-like regime. There is then an utterly sharp transition. What do I mean utterly sharp? In at least one set of measurements, there is a data point which appears to have managed to be taken right at the transition, and it is right at the intersection of the two lines. And yet the statement is, yes, viscosity increases very rapidly at high concentration. Yes, this is a power law. This is a stretched exponential. This is an intersection. And this occurs at a concentration phi of about 0.5. For one give or take and a relative viscosity of eh, 15 and someplace up here is the place where the hard spheres are supposed to have some sort of a phase transition and this occurs at 0.49 in concentration and a relative viscosity that's um, viscosity divided by the solvent viscosity about 50 this transition and that one are completely different and they're so they're sufficiently well separated that they're very definitely not the same thing okay <clears throat> uh, what else could we do well there were questions about self diffusion of lines and stars and the assertion is that if you compare two chains of the same total molecular weight. The star polymer is smaller, therefore its radius is less, therefore its alpha is less, and that's approximately correct, though you really need more star measurements and more on more different arm sizes to be sure about that. Uh, and so the linear to star is explained. Um, there is a competing question which is much harder to do the calculation on, a linear chain is a two-arm star. Suppose you compare a linear chain with a three or four or whatever number of arm stars, and the arm lengths are the same. That calculation is much more difficult to do. And um, that hasn't been done completely, but it seems to be, I think it's okay. Okay, um, the renormalization group calculation also tends to explain why in some polymer systems you see this behavior and in others you see only the rising stretched exponential, mm -hmm. namely the transition is a fixed point transition between a fixed point at zero concentration and a renormalization group fixed point someplace out here if you move the out here a bit, well, you can't go up arbitrarily in concentration. You can only get up to the melt. And if the fixed point doesn't take over until some hypothetical numerical region beyond the melt, you'll never see it. So the, the renormalization group calculation explains why eta is not a universal function of C. I shall, however, comment that if you read the book, I do comment that viscosity has these different properties, but I don't actually point out, by the way, this means that eta is not a universal concentration, function of concentration, and therefore models that say eta is a universal function of concentration, like these scaling models, are fundamentally incorrect. I don't say that because I had the facts down, but I didn't draw the conclusion. All right. What else can we say that experimentally is confirmed? Well, there are a whole bunch of experiments using probes that look for the longest length scale in a non-dilute polymer solution. And what we demonstrate is the longest length scale that is dynamically effective is the size of the whole coil. And that's sort of physically the matter. No matter how much you concentrate things, the poly the beads on a single chain will always stay attached to each other and therefore over distances like this um, bead motions must be correlated. 
If they weren't correlated, the polymer would be shredded. Biologists will remind us that if you are trying to isolate um, DNA and you are not careful, you will shear it. And you will get little fragments that are much shorter than the original. Well, you can shear a polymer. We're talking about we aren't slamming it that hard. Um, in addition, um, we can compare, the model lets us, appears to let us compare viscosity of linear chains and viscosity of rings. And if I have a ring polymer and a linear polymer, the radius of gyration of the ring, which after all could be shriveled up part of the time, the ring is smaller than the linear chain and therefore it should be less effective at increasing the viscosity of the solution precisely as observed. In contrast, uh, reptation type models say this can reptate, this can't reptate in an interesting manner because if it does it just moves in a circle uh, and therefore rings should be more effective at increasing the viscosity than linear chains and that Prediction is rejected by experiment. We also demonstrate, since we've done the calc concentration dependence of dp and eta, well, the calculation just shows that dp eta is not a constant, and models that say it is are mistaken. Okay. So that takes us to about the distance the hydrodynamic scaling model has been taken. It makes a considerable number of predictions, some quite quantitative, and those predictions have always been confirmed. There are a couple of recent papers, um, for example, there is a recent paper by Kai et al treating reptation, treating probe diffusion from the reptation point of view. It makes a large number of predictions, and these predictions do not appear to correlate very well with experiment. Um, I haven't said much about that, but um, uh, you can read the paper for yourself and ask yourself, is this true? Um, you'll be asking that a lot. Okay. At the back of the book, I note several limitations of the pay, uh, on the theory. One is the issue of B solvent, and the interesting feature that if you look at the solvent diffusion coefficient at about 400 grams per liter, oh, that's not exact. It might be 350 or 500 in different systems. But at some place near there, there's a transition in the concentration dependence of D. And at the time that I wrote the book, I couldn't explain that. I can now do so. The explanation is, here's the polymer coils. Here's something trying to get between the polymer coils. And it can't. And at about the concentration at which there are issues with the solvent being granular rather than continuous, you see this behavior. <clears throat> okay, so having said this, what are some directions for future work? Well, one picture relates to things that I said in the book are missing, treatments of internal modes. Treatments of the case where we're looking at tracer diffusion and the molecular weight of the matrix one way or the other, I guess that's the right mathematical symbol, is very different from the molecular weight of the probe. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of see what would happen, namely, if you have a small probe and a very large matrix, at some point as the probe moves, it has very different effects on different parts of the matrix polymer, and the rotating bag of beads picture of the matrix polymer is inadequate. And you would like to treat internal modes. Well, that's not as simple as it sounds. Uh, let us consider internal modes of polymers and models of polymer diffusion. 
and I'm going to draw two comparisons. And the first comparison is between the Kirkwood Reisman and the Rouse Zim models. Kirkwood Reisman is the model I talked about for hydrodynamic scaling. It's here is a polymer coil. It has a location R. If we put it in a shear field, it has an angular velocity omega, and it also has fluctuations where we skip over. And therefore, recalling that you can rotate on all three axes, we have three translational modes, three rotational modes, and if there are n beads, we have three n minus six modes that are internal. An internal mode is one that changes the relative position of beads. Now we'll skip over to Rouse Zim. Rouse Zim says, here's a polymer, and exactly what the beads represent isn't clear. The beads are connected by springs. Um, the springs only control the distance between the beads. They don't act along those axes to control rotational angles. And if we set up the force constant matrix for this, we just say we have n beads, so we have 3n coordinates, and we can set up 3n um, differential equations of motion. This looks like a bunch of coupled springs. And the way they do the analysis is to say, well, we've set this up, and the x, the y, and the z parts of the problem are separable. That's what they say. And therefore, we can break this into three n by n matrices as opposed to one big three n by three n matrix. And therefore, we have three translational modes and three n minus three modes, which are internal. That is, three n minus three modes in which the distance between the beads is changed by the motion. And you set it up and it looks perfectly reasonable. Now the problem between this is if you compare Kirkwood Reisman and, and Rouse's M, either there are three N minus three internal modes, which is what Rouse's M says, or there are three N minus six. Choose one. Uh, you have to be a little careful here. There is a difference between normal mode and collect and basis vectors that are collective coordinates that are orthogonal to each other. It's quite visibly true that the Rouse's M coordinates are a set of orthogonal coordinates in which you can do an expansion. Ditto Kirkwood Reisman is, sort of. Yeah. Um, but they're different. And you should realize, gee, Rouse's M gets a different count of internal coordinates than Kirkwood Reisman does. That's a little peculiar. There is an interesting analogy, though, because there is another problem that mathematically looks just like this one, except that the system is, well, there are two differences. The first difference is that the system is underdamped. Mm -hmm. The second difference is that the bond angles in various ways are rigid. Okay. Well, having said that, Rouse's M, Kirkwood Reisman, uh, there's another problem. And the other problem is called Raman scattering or infrared spectroscopy or inelastic neutron scattering. And all three of these techniques, if set up properly, are sensitive to molecular vibrations, molecules in crystals. And if I have a molecule in a crystal, it indubitably has three translational modes. 
If it's in a crystal, the next three modes are librational. If it's in solution, where I've done experiments, uh, the modes are rotational. And 3n minus 6 modes, in which, which are internal. And there is there's a nice set of, res, uh, of calculations due to E.B. Wilson. And what E.B. Wilson said is we can turn the crank and we can demonstrate how to get write, rewrite the system Hamiltonian in terms of 3n minus 6 internal coordinates in which we have correctly factored out the three translational and the three rotational modes. Oh, question one, why would you want to factor out the three translational and three rotational modes? Because if you are in solution for infrared spectroscopy or Raman, these six modes have eigenfrequency equal to zero. And if you decide we would like to pull out the mode frequencies of these modes, you have the difficulty that the matrix you're looking at to do this is singular. And because the matrix is singular, the usual eigenvalue, eigenfunction approach does not work. Yes? However, Wilson was a very smart guy, and he actually did this and set this up, and you get 3n minus 6 modes. Uh, if you ca look carefully at Rouse's M, it contains no rotational modes. Someplace buried in the Rouse's M coordinates are the three pole body rotations which have frequency zero. And therefore everything after that must be slightly suspect. Um, the three, the uh, mode relaxation times they get are also a little peculiar in that the relaxation rates go up very rapidly as you make them more um, the equivalent of going to higher and higher frequency. The frequencies go up very fast. In contrast, these frequencies stay in a fairly, if you look at the low and intermediate frequencies of a hydrocarbon, these frequencies don't change very quickly at all. And therefore, my inclination is to say, if you want to do something that makes sense, you have to start with Kirkwood Reisman, and you have to advance to stick in orthogonal coordinates that are consistent with the translation and rotation. Mm -hmm. In doing this, you have one problem. The Wilson, type, Wilson DCS cross paper coordinates assume that the atomic distances are fixed, inter that's fine, the angles are fixed, and therefore the relative displacement of large parts of the molecule relative to each other don't change very much. Uh, those coordinates, in fact, they assume that the dis displacements of the atoms with respect to their equilibrium positions are small. Well, that's totally reasonable for an organic molecule in a crystal. It's totally reasonable for a small organic molecule in a solvent. It's totally unreasonable for a polymer coil. And therefore, the idea is right, but the math method isn't going to help you. Well, that's a major place for advance, because if you could do that major advance, you could handle all of the fluctuation issues that Kirkwood and Reisman skip over. Now I come to another little bit, because the Kirkwood-Reisman model makes an assertion. <clears throat> and in a certain sense, the Kirkwood-Reisman model sort of resembles the statement that Stokes-Einstein's behave works. And the statement is, we have a shear field with a shear rate dv, x, dy. And we stick in the, here something that is free to rotate. And its rotation angle, its ro angular rotation rate is gamma dot over 2. Why over 2? Because, well, I guess it should be rotating the other way. Because it tries to move with the coil, and that creates force. And there's a retarding force because these pieces 
are moving up and down with respect to the solvent. And if you ask where do you get zero torque, it's when the rotation rate is gamma dot over two. Now we step ahead and we look at a calculation on spheres in a viscoelastic fluid. And the calculation is due to Snitkers. I suspect that is not how the gentleman pronounces his name. And I apologize in advance. This is within the last year. And what is shown in essence is that if we isolate this constant, and if we calculate what the constant is in a viscoelastic fluid, as we increase the shear rate, and this is just for a stuck or polymer coil, this is just for a sphere with boundary conditions. And so all you have to do is a finite element calculation. Falls off. That is, the sphere moves less and less rapidly in a viscoelastic fluid relative to the speed it would move in a normal fluid. And that that has some dramatic, that presumably has some implications for hydrodynamic coupling that have not been worked out. I will now go to two more problems and we will run out of problems and time at the same, same point. Uh, the first issue is that for viscosity anyhow, it seems that if you could calculate the viscosity enough terms, you should be able to calculate the fixed points. So that is that we said we're going to do a renormalization group approach to pushing out to high concentrations. However, in order to do this, you need to find the fixed points. Well, one of them is clearly at zero. However, the solution-like melt-like transition implies but someplace out here in concentration, there are some fixed points. And if, you, and if you do the calculation, it should become visible that the fixed points move around a bit as you change the polymer properties. And therefore, sometimes they are close enough to zero to drive this transition. And sometimes they would only drive the transition if you went to physically impossible concentrations. Well, a little piece of this stunt was done by a uh, calculation of Susan Merriam and I. We calculated the chain, 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 chain hydrodynamic interaction tensor, which corresponds to the fourth order chain, 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 and back home chain hydrodynamic interactions. And this gives us a, a more extended series for, we did it for, effectively for self-diffusion. And so you can carry out the calculation to higher order, and under modern conditions, I suspect computer algebra would let you do this fairly effectively. And hopefully if you go out to higher concentration, you get a clear higher order terms, you get a clearer understanding of what's going on. Also, in addition to going out this way, if you had a decent representation of the normal modes of two chains, in addition to looking at the translation at acting to create translation and rotation, presumably you're also doing things that distort the shape of the polymer coil, and if you had a nice internal mode representation, the um, higher order internal modes would presumably, at first the simpler ones and then the more complicated ones, would start contributing in a way you could handle numerically. <clears throat> now we come to the obstacle. And the obstacle is a, I don't currently know how to tackle this problem. Uh, I've thought of several things that do not work. The issue is as follows. All of the hydrodynamic scaling model calculations we've done, of the calculations not counting the temporal scaling onsatz, which is not a real calculation the way the other ones are, it's an onsatz, are quasi-static. That is, we say 
we have a chain here. It moves and rotates and induces motion or rotation in another chain here. And when we do an ensemble average, we <coughs> average over all possible locations of the second chain relative to the first. However, we're saying that the fact that this translation has been going on for a while is uninteresting in the sense that the force that this chain creates back on this one is determined by the current velocity of this chain mm -hmm. and the fact that this chain might have had different velocities at different times well inertial effects are damped out and are presumably not relevant to the issue at hand and therefore there's no frequency dependence all of the, the calculation is effectively done for everything seen at one instant in time and in different elements of the ensemble there are different particle positions but the fact that the particles move with respect to each other does not contribute anything. Okay. Well, suppose you want to determine, for example, the stress relaxation function. G of T says we displace this plate with respect to the other plate. There is now a force on the two plates because we've displaced one plate with respect to the other. And if I plot g of t versus t, this is really log t because it stretches out a bit. Well, for very dilute solutions, there's some relaxation which takes a little while. Of course, if it's just a solvent, a little while is almost no time at all. Uh, but if we keep adding polymer, things slow down. And eventually we get this feature that there is a region called the plateau at long time. And the plateau region isn't actually, you don't expect it to be flat, this is sort of a single exponential. But if I take a single exponential and the relaxation time is out here, the early piece of the exponential is very nearly flat on a log, semi-log plot. And then there is a region called the terminal region. And the terminal region has some characteristic time, tau, which is the terminal relaxation time. And the terminal relaxation time gets very long for large polymers. In melts, there is no concentration dependence because there's no concentration variable. But in melts, the, relax the terminal relaxation time traditionally is said to go as m to about 3.4, give or take power. It grows very quickly with increasing polymer molecular weight. Well, in order to calculate this and demonstrate you get that behavior, you need some way to gain entree and to calculate the time dependence of the forces between the particles. And at this, at this particular stage, it is a completely different calculation from those that have done, been done so far. And there is some question as to, well, how do you make this work? And the answer is, I have not actually made it work so far. And so the answer is, I can't tell you, but that is certainly a direction for future research. Um, and so, hmm. That's certainly a major challenge, time dependence, which has not yet been carried out. Uh, if you approach the field from the standpoint of polymer viscoelasticity, that is, if you start out in looking at all of your dynamic quantities, and you started out doing rheology, you would say, this is the most conspicuous feature of polymer dynamics, and therefore, this is where you ought to start looking to try to explain what is going on. And if you start there, you do not easily get to the hydrodynamic scaling model because most of the phenomena we have talked about, and a few others which I didn't bring up as much, such as the two normal stress differences, which are proportional to the square shear rate, if I recall correctly. There are some other things we haven't calculated. Um, if you try that to ask, how does this work? Um, and you start here, you will not come near hydrodynamic scaling and quasi-static calculations because 
you're looking first at a different issue. Um, nonetheless, I have now described the phenomenology of polymer solution dynamics. I don't think I have missed any major experimental techniques. There were some topics we didn't talk about in the book, and maybe I should remind you of the topics we did not talk about. I guess there is room in the world for another book. We did not talk about melts. We did not talk about rods. We talked very little about polyelectrolytes. We did not talk about nonlinear viscoelastic effects, either the classical nonlinear effects which come out of the normal stress differences or the more modern ones like shear banding. or the like. Um, didn't talk much about biopolymers, mostly because many of them are um, polyelectrolytes, and the ones that are neutral can be lumped in with all the other neutral polymers, though of course they tend to be thicker. Um, however, we did introduce a wide variety of experimental, having said we didn't do this, we did introduce a wide variety of other techniques, many of which are sort of standard like segmental motion, uh, di uh, self diffusion, tracer diffusion, uh, low shear viscosity, viscoelastic phenomena. And in addition to these, we also talked about some things which people sometimes tend to forget sedimentation. Um, then, of course, we introduced solvent motion. We talked about the huge probe diffusion literature. And then we added some totally new things. We added electrophoresis, which clearly gives driven probe motion just as sedimentation does. And the fact that you can use electrophoresis the way you use probe sedimentation has never been noticed. We talked about colloids. And at the end, having said this, we drew some inferences, namely some models that don't work as well as some that do. And finally, I talked about the hydrodynamic scaling model and the fact that research on that model is certainly incomplete at this stage. Having said that, the course has come to a completion. Have a good summer.